Tonight, is the mercenary leader who led a revolt against Vladimir Putin's power still alive? His whereabouts have been a mystery, but today we learn that Prigozhin is not actually in Belarus. It's unclear if his Wagner fighters will move to Belarus, and it's throwing more confusion on that deal that supposedly ended the armed insurrection. Now, it comes as Russian state TV is releasing new images of a raid on Prigozhin St. Petersburg property, footage showing money, wigs, and gold found at the property, and it all raises questions about what Moscow's plans are for Prigozhin. Joining me now on this, plus many, many other issues, is Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. Welcome, sir, to the program. I do want to start there on the war in Ukraine. It has obviously taken on renewed urgency after Prigozhin's uprising and Kyiv's offensive. And you've proposed, as I think many people know now, a 72-hour window as president, if you were elected, for Putin to agree to a deal that would pull him away from Beijing in exchange for the United States ending effectively its support for Ukraine. But my question to you is, why would Putin stop at only parts of Ukraine that they've already uh, they've already in invaded when he's hinted that he has much broader ambitions for Ukraine. So look, Putin would accept a deal because it allows him to get achieve something he wants. He does not enjoy being Xi Jinping's little brother in that relationship. But the reason I would do that deal is that it would still advance American interests because the top military threat that we face is the China-Russia alliance. Nobody else in either political party is talking about it. But if you combine Russia's nuclear stockpile and its hypersonic missile capabilities, combined with China's economy and its large landmass and the fact that it's an adversary to the U.S., as well as its naval capacity, they outmatch us. So I think our top objective should be to pull Putin out of that alliance. Putin does not enjoy being the second fiddle to Xi Jinping. That's why I think he'll take that deal. Well, but I think that we do have to end that Ukraine war by freezing the current lines of control. Well, look, uh, I think the other question here is if you basically give Putin what they have seized by force, how would that stop China from seizing by force Taiwan, for example? I think the principle here, many people would argue, is that there is a world order in which you don't just get to seize territory by waging wars on your neighbors. So China is has actually one constraint on going after Taiwan, and I want to tap into that constraint. Right now, Xi Jinping has confidence that Vladimir Putin is in his camp, and his bet is that the U.S. will not want to go after two allied nuclear superpowers at the same time. But if Putin is no longer in Xi Jinping's camp, then Xi Jinping will absolutely have to think twice before going after Taiwan. I do think Taiwan is more important for the U.S. than is Ukraine because we depend on the semiconductors that come from that island nation that power our modern way of life, including our cell phones, our cameras, all modern technology, our cars, and so on. So that's why I think that Taiwan and Ukraine are not really the same thing. We shouldn't treat them the same either. But it is by ending the war in Ukraine and doing that deal that requires Putin to exit his alliance with China that we also deter China from going after Taiwan in a way that avoids war. That should one, be the top one policy other objective of the next of, president. One other component of this, of course, is that Putin and Xi Jinping have much more than just economic ties. They also are both authoritarian leaders. And they, on a sort of values proposition, have more in common with each other, don't you think? Well, you could have say, said the same thing about Mao Zedong and Brezhnev back in 1972 when Nixon made the move of pulling Mao out from under Brezhnev's hands. And I think that back then Mao was the little brother in that relationship. Today, Putin is the new Mao. So I think that I don't trust Vladimir Putin on anything, but I do trust him to follow his self-interest. And I think if we're willing to normalize economic relations with Russia— if we're willing to freeze those current lines of control, if we're willing to guarantee that NATO will not admit Ukraine, as Vladimir Putin asked for in late 2021 before he invaded, then I think it will be in Putin's interest to actually renormalize those relations with the West as long as he exits that military relationship with China. And I would also require that he remove nuclear weapons from Kaliningrad, which borders Poland, as well as to remove the Russian military from the Western Hemisphere. 
That's how we advance American interests while ending the war in Ukraine. I want to turn now to a domestic policy issue. And this is actually something that you have not been particularly vocal about. And it's entitlements like Social Security and Medicare, which it's an issue that actually has become a point of contention between Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis. Question to you is, would you make changes to Social Security and Medicare if you were elected? So the classic debate right now is between tax increases on the Democrat side versus cuts to entitlements among some on the Republican side. I personally believe there is a better way, a third way. Focus on GDP growth itself. I'm the only candidate in either party who believes and acts on the fact that we can grow our way out of our problems. It is true that if we remain at less than 1%. You think you can grow your way out of Social Security and Medicare needing to, uh, if I'm, I'm presenting to you what many of your Republican colleagues say. They say that it's going to be insolvent in, in just a couple of decades. Do so you think that you can grow your way out of that problem without addressing the fundamentals of those programs? That is correct. If you continue to grow at this year's current GDP growth rate of less than 1%, then absolutely we are going to be in trouble in 20 years. We run out of money. But for most of our national history, we've grown at over three to four plus percent GDP growth. I have a clear plan of how to restore that in relatively short order. First is you unlock American energy. Will you pledge Drill, frack, burn coal, put people back to work. Will you pledge then to not touch Social Security and Medicare? Uh, Let's take into consideration your economic plans. But would you pledge not to touch Social Security and Medicare if you were elected president? I do. And in fact, the irony is, is that when we're growing at a high GDP growth rate again, by the time I'm out of office in January 2033, we will be growing at over 4%. Ironically, it's actually when the country is at its strongest economically, when our citizens are making more money, that we can then have a rational conversation about whether we have the political consensus to draw distinctions between people who have, say, made $10 million or more in their lifetime versus those who have not when it comes to security, Social Security or Medicare. All right. But and right now is not you, that environment. Americans ask, have, in a shrinking economy, we should not cut entitlements. Can I ask you about another issue? This is also something that your opponents, Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump, have called for, including DeSantis very recently, which is an end to birthright citizenship. What's your position on that? Would you end birthright citizenship? I think for a period of time, I think it's going to be necessary in this country because we have an influx of migrants across that southern border, 14,000 plus per day by some estimates crossing that southern border. That is not the rule of law. That is the abandonment of the rule of law. So if migrants are coming illegally, intentionally to be able to establish an illegal toehold in the United States, then I think that that's something that we should not abide in this country. And we should say that you were one step uh, even I, I, we should say also, I mean, you were, you're, both of your parents are Im- immigrants to the United States, so you would have been a beneficiary of birthright citizenship, but you now are saying you would ban that for people coming into the country. And what is the period of time for which that would be the case? For people coming into the country illegally. That's the key distinction. And people make this mistake all the time. And I think you got to be really careful when you talk about the difference between legal immigrants and illegal immigrants. One is founded on following the rule of law. The other is founded on breaking the rule of law. That might be and the case, a but I'm just saying that border security and immigration are not the same issue. It's- What I'm saying is that birthright citizenship, as it is currently in law, does not make that distinction between whether that person was born to someone legally or not. So you are saying that even though birthright citizenship for you was something that was in play, you would take it off the table now. And my question is also, how long would that be the case? And also, how would you do it? Would you go to Congress for a constitutional amendment? Well, actually, I've supported the 28th Amendment to the Constitution. I'll actually go one step further on this, Abby, is that I don't think someone just because they're born in this country, even if they're a sixth generation American, should automatically enjoy all the privileges of citizenship until they've actually earned it. So one of the things I've said is that every high school student who graduates from high school should have to pass the same civics test that every immigrant has to pass in order to become a citizen of this country. 
I believe that there are civic duties attached to citizenship, so much so that I don't think you should automatically get your right to vote at age 18 unless you have passed that same citizenship test that immigrants have had to pass right. or else have served the country. Uh, under, so, understood. I mean, this is part of my I, broader pro-civic vision. I, I, I understand that, although I think there are some questions about why uh, younger Americans would have less citizenship rights than older Americans. But I do want to move on here. Um, you, you've been seeing a bump in recent polling, uh, and uh, that is probably as a result of you being in a lot of different places and campaigning. And in New Hampshire, former President Trump had some unusually warm words for you. I want you to take a listen. Actually, Vivek is, is yeah, well, Ramishwamy is leading most of our candidates. And you know why? Because he says Trump is one of the greatest presidents in the history of our country. And I said, I like that guy. I like him. I said, are you sure he's running against me? You know, that's a pretty severe statement, but, but he's very good. He's actually a pretty good guy. So what do you make of that? I, I, I should say some people have suggested that Trump is using your candidacy to undermine his biggest rival right now, which is DeSantis. We're very early in this race, so anybody who's trying to draw who the front runners are before the first debate, I think is missing the plot, just like they would have in 2016. I'm running to lead this nation forward. It's true that Trump and I have a couple things in common. We're both outsiders who have had success in business, who did not grow up in the world of politics. And I think we have a lot of common cause, both in standing for the America First agenda. But I'm in this race to take that America First agenda to the next level, to actually secure the southern border by moving the military to secure that border, shutting down government agencies that should not exist. I've said that I would end affirmative action by executive order, by rescinding the one that Lyndon Johnson wrote into law that every other Republican president since then could have negated. So in many ways, I'm going further than Trump, but I also hope to unite the country by doing it based on first principles and moral authority. So do I respect a lot of his accomplishments for this country? Absolutely, and I've been unapologetic about saying so. I'm in this race as the first millennial ever to run for this nomination to take that to the next level because I have fresh legs and I'm reaching the next generation while I do it. I, I have to ask you, would you be open to being Trump's running mate? I would not. I am actually focused on winning the presidency. If you're like me, got two young sons at home making the sacrifices that we are, putting over $15 million of my money into this campaign already. Hard-earned money, not what I inherited. I didn't inherit money. You know what? You make those sacrifices if you want to actually drive a national revival. Like Ronald Reagan did it in 1980. You know, there was the Reagan Revolution. I, uh, I say in, in a good spirited way, we're looking for the Ramaswamy Revolution so in 2024. Did, did and I that's what I think you, we're going to deliver. Did I hear you say you've put in $50 million into your campaign so far? Oh, over 15, 15 is what I said. Yep, 15 so million dollars. And so how yes. much, where will you stop on self-funding? We'll stop at nothing. To be honest with you, we've gotten also over 60,000 unique donors. I haven't said that, I think, in, in other settings yet. We crossed 60,000 unique donors at the start of July. I know many other candidates are talking about 40,000 being a tough threshold for the Republican debate stage. I'm a first-time candidate. I've never had a political donor or donor list in my life. We've already crossed 60,000. So this is a grassroots campaign. People are responding to the message of putting American interests first, but doing it based on principles and moral foundations. And I think that's going to take us not only all the way to the White House, but to a national revival in the eight years thereafter. That's what I'm uh, looking to lead. All right, Vivek Ramaswamy, thank you very much for joining us tonight on all of those issues. Thank you, Abby.